Calvin cycle, named after biochemist Melvin Calvin, uses carbon from carbon dioxide and energy from the light reaction to produce materials for plant growth. By exposing green algae to radioactive carbon dioxide, Calvin first detected radioactivity in a three carbon compound called phosphoglyceric acid. He also noticed that many kinds of plants immediately fix carbon from atmospheric carbon dioxide into three carbon compounds. Calvin called such plants carbon-3 plants or C3 plants. On paper, the Calvin cycle appears to be about 38% efficient. This means that, theoretically, 38% of the energy the Calvin cycle receives ends up in the chemical bonds of carbohydrates with the rest of the energy lost as heat. But in reality, the Calvin cycle performs far less efficiently than expected. In fact, C3 plants can usually convert less than 1% of the light energy they absorb into carbohydrates. To understand why this happens, we need to take a closer look at carbon dioxide. One problem is the relative scarcity of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, only 0.03% as compared to oxygen at 21%. Carbon dioxide must compete with the more plentiful oxygen for the attention of ribulose diphosphate. Although RUDP is supposed to combine with the carbon dioxide to produce the unstable six carbon intermediate, it often joins with oxygen instead. The oxidized RUDP then goes through a series of reactions which eliminates it from the Kelvin cycle. So, considering all the obstacles, it's no wonder that the ability of carbon-3 plants to fix carbon into carbohydrates doesn't measure up to expected efficiency. Around the time Calvin wound up his work, evidence was mounting to suggest that sometimes carbon doesn't first make its way into three carbon compounds. In plants generally found in tropical and desert climates, the first organic molecule in which carbon is fixed is a four carbon compound. Consequently, these are known as C4 plants. But why should C4 plants thrive in these environments? Let's begin to answer the question by comparing the two types of plants. In both C3 and C4 plants, the interior of the leaf is called the mesophyll. In C3 plants, the mesophyll cells, where photosynthesis occurs, are arranged in two layers. At the top is the palisade layer, and below it is the spongy layer, named for its sponge-like appearance. Embedded in the spongy layer are bundle sheath cells, which surround the network of veins spread throughout the leaf. In C4 plants, the mesophyll cells are tightly clustered in large rings around the bundle sheath cells. These bundle sheath cells are larger and contain their own chloroplasts. However, the grana inside are few and poorly developed and are virtually unable to carry out the light reaction. So, it is left to the chloroplasts in the mesophyll cells with their well-developed grana to produce the bulk of ATP and NADPH2 for the dark reaction. And to make life even more difficult, C4 dark reactions require the involvement of both mesophyll and bundle sheath cells. Because they're so close, materials can pass from one to the other. Carbon dioxide diffuses through the membrane of the mesophyll cell and enters the dark reaction by being fixed into oxaloacetate, a four carbon compound. Then NADPH2 approaches the oxaloacetate and converts it to malate, also with four carbons. And then 
To the great surprise of the researchers who first noticed it, malate diffuses not only out of the chloroplast, but right out of the mesophyll cell and into the bundle sheath cell where it promptly enters a chloroplast. Here, malate re-energizes NADP to form NADPH2. In so doing, the malate breaks into a three-carbon compound called pyruvate. And to the further amazement of biologists, carbon dioxide. Now, it may seem to be a pointless exercise to pick up carbon dioxide, and then release it without even using it. But there is a point. The carbon dioxide released by the malite then enters the Kelvin cycle. And as we know, it is the shortage of carbon dioxide that limits the efficiency of the Kelvin cycle and consequently the production of glucose. If we look closely at the part of the dark reaction in the mesophyll cell, we see that that whole portion of the reaction is, in reality, simply a pump that ensures an abundant supply of carbon dioxide for the Kelvin cycle. There is also a second mechanism in C4 plants that improves efficiency, and this is it. After the pyruvate diffuses into the mesophyll cell, it encounters ATP and becomes phosphoenolpyruvate, or PEP. It is PEP that picks up carbon dioxide, forming oxaloacetate. Since PEP has a low affinity for oxygen, it eagerly awaits the arrival of carbon dioxide, which certainly isn't the case with the RUDP in C3 plants. As we said earlier, C4 plants thrive in tropical and desert environments, far better than C3 plants. The explanation is now within our grasp. Special pores in the leaf surface called stomata, regulate the movement of liquids and gases in and out of the leaf. In the hot sun, these pores very nearly close to prevent excessive loss of water to the air. But this creates a tremendous problem for the plant. Now, the diffusion of carbon dioxide into the leaf is severely restricted. C4 plants, with their carbon dioxide pumps, can easily cope with the small amounts that do manage to trickle through. But C3 plants need all the carbon dioxide they can get. So choking off the supply is intolerable. Thus, in hot regions, when carbon dioxide intake is diminished, C4 plants thrive where others fail. In temperate zones, where there is little need to close the stomata, both types of plants flourish. This is the towering redwood, Sequoia sempervire, which grows in the thin belt along the northern Pacific coast of the United States. These redwoods are the world's tallest conifers. One specimen has been measured at nearly 120 meters, as tall as a 40-story building. At this height, and their extensive root systems, 
allow them greater access to minerals than water. But being tall also has its disadvantages. The needles of the giant redwood, high above the forest floor, constantly lose water to the atmosphere through the process of transpiration. Transpiration occurs through special pores called stomata. Each stoma regulates the exchange of gases between the plant and the atmosphere. The diffusion of carbon dioxide in and oxygen out. And since the concentration of water vapor is usually higher inside the plant than outside, water vapor also diffuses out. This water is constantly replaced by a complex system of transports called the xylem. The xylem consists of reinforced, stiff cells, which help the tree withstand intense storms and wind. It extends from the root tips all the way up to the ends of the leaves. In the trunk, the innermost part of the xylem is heartwood and is made up of older, inactive cells. These cells have been completely filled with pigment, resins, tannins, and gums, providing added strength to the tree and protecting against insect pests. The thin outer layer of xylem or sapwood is active and consists of elongated cells with many openings or pits Pits are particularly numerous on the tapered ends where one cell meets the next. Continuous vertical pathways are thus formed, enabling water and minerals to be transported up to the leaves. Since in a large tree, several tons of water are being transported at any one time, a vast number of these pathways are needed. But just how a tree manages to raise water more than 100 meters above the ground is an astounding feat of engineering. Contrary to what we might think, there is no significant pumping action from osmotic pressure in the roots. Instead, plants use the unavoidable loss of water during transpiration to their advantage. As water molecules are constantly lost through the stomata, Replacement molecules are drawn up through the xylem pathways. Current theory suggests that the key to this amazing accomplishment is a unique property of water. But to fully understand this, we need to look at an individual water molecule. Two hydrogen atoms are joined to a single oxygen atom at a bond angle of 104.5 degrees. Because of this asymmetry and the fact that oxygen has a stronger attraction for electrons than hydrogen, water is a polar molecule. It has a negative charge on the oxygen side and a positive charge near the hydrogen. The oxygen atom with its slight negative charge is attracted to hydrogen atoms in the cellulose of the cell wall. So, the molecules adhere to the sides and prevent the column of water from pulling away and breaking. Since, once broken, that particular xylem pathway would almost certainly cease to function. Even more important, the hydrogen atoms, with their slight positive charge, are attracted to the negative oxygen atoms of the other water molecule, drawing the molecules close enough to form hydrogen bonds. This effectively binds the water molecules together so that when one is pulled up, others move along with it. And the loss of water through transpiration creates a tremendous pull on the water in the xylem column. This binding force, called cohesion, gives a one millimeter wide column of water as much tensile strength as a steel wire of the same diameter. Yet, as powerful as the forces of adhesion and cohesion are, they are not capable of filling an empty column 
100 meters tall. Botanists have determined that in the spring, as the new layers of xylem tissue begin to grow, the cells draw water laterally from the older cells. This keeps the new cells filled as they grow to full size. At maturity, the end walls become more permeable as the pits develop and the transport system becomes operational. The whole intricate water transport system begins with the fine single-celled root hairs, which spread extensively throughout the soil. Minerals such as nitrates, phosphates, and potassium, essential for plant growth, are dissolved in the groundwater. A number of observations indicate that roots absorb mineral ions through the process of cation exchange. The root hairs selectively absorb the mineral ions, and water follows by osmosis to reduce the concentration gradient. Once inside, the demands of transpiration and photosynthesis continually draw water and minerals up the xylem pathways to the leaves. Outside the xylem is a second transport system called the phloem, which extends throughout the plant parallel to the xylem. This intricate branch network of cells distributes the carbohydrates produced in photosynthesis to all the active cells in the plant. In the leaves, the phloem picks up the carbohydrates by active transport. Additional water is drawn in from surrounding cells by osmosis, increasing the hydrostatic pressure within the phloem cells. At the other end of the system, carbohydrates are removed for storage and cell nourishment. Water is also removed reducing the hydrostatic pressure within the cell. So, a continuous flow of carbohydrates from source to area of need is maintained. Water and carbohydrate molecules pass from one phloem cell to another through the specialized end walls of each cell. The end wall, containing numerous perforations or pores, is called a sieve plate. If damage occurs and the cell walls are ruptured, a special protein moves quickly to the pores and plugs them, cutting off the flow in much the same way as clotting blood seals the wound. The two transport systems, xylem and phloem, crucial role in the competitive struggle for the lion's share of sunlight, enabling plants to ascend to greater 